<laughs> Gregory Miller is a Chief Development Officer for the Open Source Digital Voting Foundation. He leads all aspects of the Foundation's resource development, corporate partner alliances, public outreach, and government and legal affairs. Gregory Miller. Thanks. So, notwithstanding public relations um, imperialistic running dog lies, um, it was a bit overstated, but yeah, I do have a lot of responsibilities at the OSTV. Um, welcome and thanks for having me. Um, I've spent most of the day on an airplane, so um, I literally just rolled off of it. And uh, it's not, I'm not even quite certain what's going to be beyond this first slide, so um, I, may have the, I may have the wrong deck up, so um, bear, bear with me if you will. So, um, good evening, and uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about the uh, opportunities and challenges of open source um, in government and government IT. So um, I think the reason that we know a bit about this uh, is because um, that's what we do. Um, the Open Source Digital Voting Foundation's Trust the Vote project is working on a pretty large scale um, elections technology framework. And elections are this seemingly simple, horribly complicated uh, systems of um, a democratic process that runs at the state level. And there really is no federal sense of an election other than certain federal election laws. So um, we, we've come to understand uh, how to work with uh, at least 50 different states. I say that because there are territories included. Some 3,500 jurisdictions across the country. Um, everyone uh, is absolutely convinced they have the best way of doing what they do. So it's, it's, an, interesting, uh, it's an interesting thing. And um, you know, all of us on the team came out of the Silicon Valley um, various companies that you would probably know. A, a gaggle of us came out of Netscape Communications and this became a pretty interesting project that sort of had some germination inside the Mozilla group. Um, the Mozilla Foundation you all know is the brings you Firefox. And uh, when we undertook this project we thought we had a good deal of experience in the commercial software industry certainly um, and ought to be able to make that portable. We, we discovered quickly that its portability is quite limited and I'll try to give you a, a, a bit of an idea why that is. It's complicated by the fact that there is a rapidly changing landscape in the sort of traditional world of government IT. Uh, it has been driven principally by what we call the digital democracy uh, and the impact of the digital age, arguably the third age, uh, on government uh, is, is wreaking some untold havoc depending upon which side of the aisle you're on and which side of the podium you're on. The, the we.gov movement, which is sort of a spin out of that, uh, is this whole notion that the availability of information ought to be as transparent as possible and the availability of technology and where we've come with regard to the internet in particular uh, really should put FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act, up on its ear and, and, it, and it has. So one of the problems that we face with any complex software development project uh, is the sort of sexy allure of the presentation layer. So thanks to Drupal and lots of really cool things out there today, the ability to, to throw up a web page that uh, has a pretty decent uh, look and feel to it, like data.gov, for example, gives a false sense of impression to everybody, including legislatures and those who make decisions about what it costs to do things and how fast things should go. Um, a, a, I think a rather misleading view of the world. The second aspect of that is that the data, the, the we.gov movement, which is principally built around this data.gov facility that, that came out of this current administration, um, has sort of misplaced the emphasis on what is happening with the rapid availability of information to the public. Um, it's one thing to go plumb a large scale database of information, um, craft an API, make that information available perhaps utilize some of the, the things that we know well, such as XML and whatnot, and then throw up a, a, a sexy looking front end and presto, guess what, I'm looking at things I never could look at before, and there you have it. Um, open source lands in government and now we have a whole new world, right? Um, not exactly. Uh, the open source impact, uh, I think, goes far beyond data. And all I can tell you from my, my job, day in and day out, dealing with, with, with governments, uh, and particularly um, the, the political body that makes up this nation, 
there is a huge mis mis misunderstanding and misimpression about what we do and what open source means and what it does to sort of rethink uh, government IT. Now that said, there is an enormous opportunity there, um, just an enormous opportunity. One of the, uh, one of the interesting aspects about the, the opportunities and challenges is the, the fact that everybody wants to go very quickly to get something done, and then you run into the government machinery. So the notion of hurry up and file this paperwork. Um, a couple of examples of that that we've run into, what I call the Travis County travesty. So Travis <coughs> County is the jurisdiction that we're currently working in and making a proposal to pretty much redefine how election night reporting is done. Today, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crazy process that if you happen to buy a talk of mine tomorrow, you'll get to kind of see that process and, and played out in animation. But essentially what happens is, is that um, there is this, this very lethargic process that has a lot of latency to it that compiles this data, puts it up onto uh, these data files, passes them out to the media and whatnot, they load them up and then they rapidly put their media guys on it and they produce sexy graphics on television and guess what you get to see um, the exit polls and how are things happening. Um, they, Travis County really said we got to change that. We, we ought to be able to express this data in a feed that can be pushed out to the net. Anyone could get access to it, write to it, and, and put up their own services to, to mine that data. And that would really dramatically improve transparency and accessibility and, and sort of increase the whole trust factor, etc. So they wanted that to have done. So what they did was they put out an RFP, right? So that's part of the government process of commercial software as you put out a request for proposal. And then came things like, if you intend to respond for this, be prepared to put up a $5 million performance bond. Uh, when, you, when you answer this RFP, it has to be produced in 12 copies, hard copy, 12 separate copies, plus a 13th, they all have to be in sealed envelopes, they have to have notarized attestation documents, and you have to follow an unbelievable labyrinth of procedure um, that's, regulat uh, that's regulatory in nature that controls this, this process because there has to be absolute transparency in bidding. And so this notion that, the, that Travis County's elections officials had that they could put up a new, a new system in literally a matter of weeks, which using our common data model, they could do it probably quicker than that, turned out to be a matter of months just to get the, the fair bid, bidding and contracting process and procurement process set up to take it. So it's really a hurry up and wait. The other one is the, sun, the sunshine effect on agility. So in most states, there's this thing called the, the Sunshine Act. Um, and of course, Justice Brandeis said it really well. Um, sunshine's the best, best disinfectant. Uh, and that's the whole idea of transparency. Um, in a perverse <laughs> outcome, Sunshine Acts, particularly in the state of California, have the absolute opposite effect on what you want in an agile environment. So, as we're working with the San Francisco City's uh, Voting Systems Task Force, or LA County System Task Force, um, there are these enormous amount of rules and regulations about how you can meet, and how every meeting has to be a public meeting which has invited comment periods, there has to be notice and publication, etc. And yes, all the attorneys in California have uh, opined that that includes meetings that take place digitally, which immediately nuked our wiki, dropped our blog, um, put a hole in our source code control system. Because in order for this process to, per to take partake under the Sunshine Act, there were certain things that had to happen. So the collaboration that we intended to set up to spin up a project was completely hampered by the very act that was intended to create the transparency. I still say there's a tremendous opportunity out there if you can navigate this. But there's one thing that we know for sure. Certainly I know this to the bone. Government CIOs are a little risk averse. And as a result, there is a great deal of legacy thinking that goes in there. When it comes to the podium, they talk a great fight because they have to, it's politically correct to do so. Then comes the implementation. So what is transparency then in the government context? Well, from an open source perspective, um, it's, it's a different yet similar concept. So there's transparency in the procurement process, which I just began to explain to you. 
There are three other areas, usability acceptance testing, which also has a high degree of transparency that's incumbent upon it. Certification requirements, the thing that's, that's largely overlooked. I've spent uh, months, months in, in, uh, in spirited intellectual discussions with a number of uh, evangelical open source leaders who I have a great deal of respect for in every regard otherwise, who were absolutely certain that it just can't be that difficult to build a trustworthy voting machine with open source software. And we're laminating the fact that we were creating the Manhattan Project. However, they failed to recognize that in this country, voting systems have to be certified, subject to federal certification standards. And those standards are quite detailed and quite expensive. I'm going through an accreditation process now for one piece of our framework. It costs about $2 million to process that certification. And the certification procedure right now, my application, is 375 pages. Now, this is all done in the spirit of transparency and accountability and accuracy and verification and auditability. And we certainly subscribe to all of those things. But it really... That would is, is an entire rat hole of a discussion in a different forum. But I, I will not attempt to disagree with you on that, certainly. But nevertheless, in effort to try to repair that problem in some fashion, the certification standards have grown increasingly complex. And let's face it, um, we all, for those of us who work in the, in the depths of, uh, of technology, I, I spent a good portion of my life in information security. It, it's foolhardy to say that any system is secure. Foolish, at best. Um, and so the very problem of security in voting machines actually gave rise to our entire foundation. Again, another discussion. But the point is that there is this complexity in certification that everyone misses. And certification doesn't apply just to voting machines. In fact, there are lots of wonderful government IT opportunities for us all to think about building a better mousetrap that we have to come to understand probably will be subject to some certification, especially if it's anything to do with high assurance or fault tolerance. Then you get NIST involved. As a result, you have more process controls, more public vetting. And I liken the government OSS development process to be a bit more like a bazaar inside the cathedral. For those of you who are familiar with the seminal uh, essay on the, on the topic, um, it's really neither a bazaar nor a cathedral, but a bit of one contained in the other. Now, outside of the open source software sense, there are three additional areas of transparency we have to consider. First and foremost is data, the data itself, such as the Freedom of Information Act and, and its associated uh, uh, regulatory schemes that make, have to make that data accessible. Of the process, there's transparency needed in the process. If you're going to build trustworthy machinery that's going to run in a production setting within government, you have to be able to convince people that what you built um, was done in a process that will meet the standards that may require certification. Again, high assurance, fault tolerance provides a a whole new uh, opportunity for us. And of the outcomes, certainly for an election, we need to know that the election is verifiable and it is audible. So how does transparency benefit the government? Well, it should be, that should be pretty obvious. I feel silly putting this slide up. But um, obviously, from the point of view of citizens, we're looking at, at at least two constitutionally mandated concepts, and one that's not constitutionally mandated as much as it's morally mandated. And so if we can't produce systems that ensure equal protection and the support of due process, let alone enfranchisement, then we aren't achieving transparency in government IT. And incidentally, with regard to due process, um, I have argued several times that we are having our own due process hamstrung by the red tape and bureaucracy that's necessary to have these projects move forward, uh, especially when you're asking a, an entity to post a $5 million performance bond in order to participate uh, in the bid. Uh, in the case of the state of California for their voter registration system, that was a $50 million performance bond that is mandated by law. Essentially, what the state of California did was tell everybody that it's an open RFP process and we'd love to see an open source solution so long as it's either from IBM Global, EDS, or Oracle. Long as it's one of the three of those, we're all good. 
From the point of view of government, certainly audit controls, verification, and compliance of the law would be the, the three um, issues that where transparency uh, plays a big part. And, and finally, for everybody, hopefully transparency can engender trust. So there are four corners of government adoption I want, I want to pass on to you. When you think about whether you want to go attack a problem in government because you can build a better Social Security Administration system or you've got a better idea about, about how to, how to, uh, to, uh, to help health care, which is health, the health IT, um, consider these four concepts. The first one, one is review, all right? So um, as I said, transparency in government IT is, is rapidly changing. Um, this notion of public vetting of, of high assurance applications is a bit of a quandary, okay? The problem is that the traditional engineering methodology to develop fault tolerance systems is highly structured and highly disciplined. It is nearly orthogonal to the agile processes and the somewhat organized chaos that precedes the highly iterative environment that we experience today in a web development environment. These two are at odds with each other. I, I'm not sure they're completely orthogonal. A couple of my engineers think they are. I tend to think of them more as a yin-yang relationship. So you, you have that issue. There is this degree of secrecy that comes around some applications because there is a school of thought that says, we're not so certain that we want people to understand the process by which we produce these systems because of their nature of security, et cetera, et cetera. Then you have the argument on the other side, I guess our side of the camp that would say, but wait a minute, we all know the same. When a thousand eyes are looking, all bugs are shallow. Um, let's make the whole process transparent so we can ensure there's no accidental trapdoor. It is nevertheless a quandary. Um, there are challenges of working in what I call the fishbowl, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. The last thing it, that you have to be careful of is what I affectionately refer to as accidentally deputizing a lynch mob. So we, uh, we had a project in the District of Columbia that I'll speak to in a minute, uh, what I now affectionately refer to as the DC incident. Um, where if you have an agenda at bay that someone, um, no matter how good your cause is, if the outcome of your cause poses a threat to their cause, your cause suddenly is subservient to that cause, and you will suddenly find yourself in the wrath of political destruction. Return on investments, a second notion that, that you've got to have to think about, and this one's interesting, right? Because this, this is not the commercial sector, it's the government sector, and, and I, we hear this all the time. Governments are talking about return on investment, return on investment. I gently try to correct them, or at least steer them in a different direction, because it's really about total cost of ownership in the government setting. And TCO with open source has a story. Unfortunately, I don't think the story is as rosy as we'd like it to be, but it is a story nonetheless. But ROI is nevertheless important in the government setting because it's the way it is their, their code for cost savings and operational efficiencies. So if you can think about total cost of ownership and present your case in that regard, knowing that they are repackaging is what they call the return on their investment, then you guys can get on the same page and the translator is functioning. The third area is licensing. Um, this one's a little bit near and dear to my heart because um, after a sufficient amount of time, actually not entirely sufficient, I still enjoy it, but um, after enough time as an engineer banging away against marketing um, for product life cycles in large corporations and, and smaller ones too, um, I actually ended up wandering my way into law and uh, became a patent attorney. So uh, I actually am a patent and licensing lawyer on, on top of all this, um, although in recovery, I claim. Um, and this was probably, and still remains today, one of the least understood, most controversial, and for the evangelist amongst us, most heated discussion that ever rises up, which is the notion of open source licensing in the government setting. I uh, can tell you that we're, we're blessed to have some of the best legal <coughs> counsel in DC and in the Silicon Valley backing us um, in our intellectual property and our licensing work. Um, Heather Meeker, who is counsel for the Mozilla Foundation, is our counsel. She's you could Google her. I think you'd find that, that there probably is no one even close to her uh, with regard to the depth and breadth of, of experience in, in licensing law in the open source setting. Um, and it turns out that for all the goodness that the GPL may provide for a lot of settings, it absolutely fails in production and government. And this may be one of the only valuable takeaways from this talk tonight, is understanding that the GPL does not work in government. And for those who will say, oh yes it does, ask them which agency they're referring to. 
because there are certain three-letter agencies in the government that make up their own rules, and indeed the GPL is just fine for them. But I can give you several other three-letter three agencies that it won't work. And here's why. The challenges of the open source license in the standard setting with the GPL, um, there's a number of them. I, I just picked four or five of them to, to just point out why there's a problem. So in the GPL, um, traditionally the notion of venue doesn't exist, right? So in the government setting, the notion of venue is essential. Venue means if there's ever a dispute with this license, I need to know which body of law is going to control and what grounds we're going to fight it out on. And it is a non-negotiable point because in many cases it's, it's controlled by federal or state regulation. So any contract, any license for any technology that is acquired by a government agency has to articulate a choice of venue, choice of law. You could look it up, but the GPL is actually acidic to such a notion. March in rights. So March in rights, if, if you've never heard of this, um, the Bayh-Doyle Act several years ago, a long time ago in fact, uh, made it possible for nonprofits who were working on government dollars to claim intellectual property rights in the technology they were developing on the behalf of the government. Okay? Now, that's a double-edged sword, and it's a rat hole of a discussion here, better left for IP law reviews. But what I will tell you is, is that marchant rights become a thick piece of the contract when you're trying to give something to the government. All right? And it turns out the marchant rights are a double-edged sword. They work both ways. So that becomes almost orthogonal to the concept of an open source license. If some agency is going to assert some intellectual property or attempt to assert intellectual property rights over that. So we have to address marching rights. Sovereign immunity, um, another rather technical notion, but it has to do with whether the state uh, is immune from breaching any contract. So if they violate your open source license, um, can you go after them? Um, and certifications, and this one's the last one, right? So open source licensing in the standard world doesn't contemplate the notion that you may be subject to a state or federal certification in order to have your software approved for production use. And those certifications have a lot to say about the preceding elements that I just mentioned. The bottom line is, much to our frustration, and I can only ask you to believe, believe me, though you know me not, we really did not want to fork yet another license. But in order for us, on the advice of all of our advisors and regulators around the country, to have a hope of what we're doing, actually one day going into production and affecting how public elections are run, there's some rules we have to agree to play by. And so the only way to do that was to take the MPL, the Mozilla Public License, and build something called the OSDV Public License the only open source public license that as far as we know, and I always hate saying words of exclusion like this, but as far as we know, the only public license in the globe, on the globe today, in use, in production use, that accounts for the government obstacles to adopt open source in a public setting. The OPL is available. We have a rationale document that goes with it. You can go to our website, you can go to our wiki, you can go look it up. Um, it mirrors and tracks with the Mozilla public license, so as the MPL changes, it changes too. But we were able to contractually get into the public license in a manner that all parties accepted the necessary conditions to make that effective. The last one is deployment. And this one's another quagmire. So it turns out that if you were to go grab a definition off, off, of, off of Google, pick, pick your favorite source, um, Wikipedia or whatever, and take a look at the definition of open source software, you'll notice that nowhere in that definition is the word deployment ever mentioned. Open source software and the open source software movement is about development. I argue there's actually two sides to that coin. It's either a development model or a licensing model as you choose. But nevertheless, it says nothing about deployment. And here is where the rubber hits the road. So let's say you've got a great piece of software. The thing rocks. It could really completely rechange how the Department of Health Human Services deploys, you know, resources in earthquakes. You know, it's a beautiful system. It takes advantage of RSS feeds. It has a way of getting into data that they have and mobilizing people. It's wonderful. But the problem is that in order for it to get into production in DHS, 
you have got to come in with the ability to install, stand up, support, and maintain that implementation. That's a whole different business model. Now we speak from some, some experience on this because the Open Source Digital uh, Voting Foundation and the Trust the Vote Project are not a vendor. We are truly, honest God, a 501c3, not a c4, not a c6, we are a c3 organization. We're identical to, to the Mozilla Foundation and Apache and, 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 and even Linux in many ways. We are not a service shop. We're not a service provider. We're not a systems integrator. We do the heavy lifting of the technology design and development and testing and certification. And then we put it out there for others to go deploy. And that was our business model from day one when we got started inside the a boardroom of a venture capital firm that I was at uh, in Palo Alto. We said, we want to redefine this industry because the industry is messed up in a bad way. There are two vendors left who control 86% of America's elections infrastructure. Two. One of them is a foreign company. Okay? So, don't let that get too buzzy. But the fact of the matter is, um, purely licensed to work in the United States, but nevertheless a foreign, foreign interest. That kind of market dysfunction is just ridiculous when you're talking about critical democracy infrastructure, when you're talking about something so essential to the cornerstone of our democracy to privatize, which is what the HAVA Act did in 2002, how America votes is untenable, right? But to get the systems, get that technology in the play, you've got to be a systems integrator. You have to be, have the ability to post a big bond, performance bond, to have a call center, to have field engineers and application specialists. It's not happening. What do you do? And that's the challenge of government open source software. The answer, we think, and what we wanted to do with the voting systems industry is, is to put it on its ear. Now, there are, there are people out there, you know, opponents of ours, who say that we're trying to destroy the voting systems industry. We want to march in with open source software and, and, and kill it. And ESNS and, uh, and Premier and, and Dominion are going to go away. Not so. In fact, they're welcome to take our license if they want. No, in fact, what we wanted to do was completely redefine that industry and how it works by lowering those barriers to entry and enabling a whole new class of voting systems vendor, a systems integrator, like Cadence Solutions in, in, in uh, uh, Richmond, Virginia, who can come in and take our code and go into the state of Virginia and do what they do well there, which is build and deploy systems for government. Now, they don't have a, a group that does voting systems, but to come and get our technology was a great way for them to do this. So one avenue for you to consider if you're looking at government IT and open source is to go find that right-sized systems integration partner that you can team with who can get your code into production. And oh, by the way, they confront all those heavy lifting things on their side of the equation that you can't possibly afford to do. And they might even pay you for your time to keep the thing going if it turns out to be uh, a nice little project for them. There's, there's a nice quid pro quo there. So you have to be careful about understanding the development versus deployment model. It's, it's complicated. Um, and, and the notion of systems integrators is about the only way this is going to work. There is another um, project uh, that one of our board members, uh, Brian Sebeck, is working on uh, called the Commons. Um, there's also Code for America, and you should look at both of those too, because those are projects that can, can pull together the group. And that's the last point I want to make about this. Um, open source projects have the best chance for success when they have the greatest momentum behind them. The reason that Linux has the installed base inside government today is not because of the Linux Foundation, and not so much because of, of Torvalds or any of us. It's because of Red Hat. It's because of a company that came up and said, I'll be the guy to go in and get that stuff deployed. But the reason that's happened is because of the maturity. The average maturity of that project has reached a point now where those guys with the suits, with the hazmat suits, are now willing to take a run, take a risk at it. So you've got to either have a project that's gaining a tremendous amount of momentum in a very short order, or you have to team with a systems integrator who can help get you in the door, or you have to all partner together and work towards a common, like the, the Commons Project or Code for America. Challenges of release engineering. Again, it's one thing to go develop great code bases and, and get the tree out in GitHub and whatnot. It's another thing to actually put it in production. Fact of the matter is, 
I was sequestered until just this month from telling this story, which I'll probably tell a little bit more tomorrow or, or afterwards if those are interested. But it was release engineering that caused the DC incident. In fact, you know, just last week in this very city, uh, Alex Halderman from University of Michigan got up on stage in front of you know, several hundred people and said, look, the code, the code was elegant. The code was the best code I've ever seen of any elections technology I've looked at. But it wasn't the code that killed us. It was a series of Lollapalooza faux pas in release engineering that took that system down. And that leads me to the transom hazard. You have got to find a way to have a relationship with who's going to actually deploy this stuff, who's going to use it, in such a way that there can be a nice relationship, a good dialogue going on. You can't just take it, throw it over the transom, and say, here's the readme file, and hope they'll actually double click it. This whole new order of the commercial software industry is, is, is what I think is, is really going to take this thing forward. We talk about this in the Valley all the time. This notion that maybe what's happening here is that you are at a very important pivotal point in this third age. So if we think of the digital age as the third age, we had the industrial age, we had the agrarian age. Between each age, there's been a gap that people had to jump across. And some fell into it, some were drag kicking and screaming. But that movement from one age to another, you live in truly exciting times because you may well be responsible for building the bridges across this gap from the industrial age to the information age. And it works like this. It may be, and this of course does not make people like some of our favorite folks up in Redmond very happy, but it may be that the process of building software in order to ensure its accuracy, transparency, verification and security requires the commons, requires the bazaar, not the cathedral. And it may be that the business of software, the commercial software industry, is morphing into one of a deployment system where the code is built in the camps of the open source world and deployed by people who are in a professional capacity to do so. Our job is to maintain the sanctity of the, the code, that code base. If we're right, that code base is as fundamental to the digital age as raw materials were to the industrial age. And if we need to have pure grade steel, there are things we do. If we need to have pure grade code, there's things we have to do. So a little bit about um, transparency gone sideways. Um, how many of you are familiar, uh, this would actually be a good, good, good study for me. Um, how many of you are familiar with the um, the long distance voting internet, they called it internet voting project in the District of Columbia last fall in, in compliance with the Overseas uh, Military Voting Act. The read about it counts. That's actually what I'm really trying to get at. Okay, well I saw a couple of hands raised. I'm actually relieved. <laughs> I can go to different circles and whoop, everybody, everyone's hand goes up. Okay, so real, ba real briefly, here's what happened. So what it was, what it intended to be, as, as Vince Cerf, who, who, was, who led a group at Google to help us vet the security of this technology, which is a bit of an oxymoron when it comes to, to voting systems, it was meant to be a worked example. It was meant to be a pilot. It was called a pilot. It was meant to be a pilot. Here's the deal. Half of all voters, American citizens eligible to vote, who are stationed overseas, either in NGOs or military operations, Roughly half of them never have their votes counted. One in four of them, one in four of them um, get through and so have gotten through in some elections. So roughly half of them have had problems getting their votes counted. Part of it is they're in the back mountains of Kandahar and, and the possibility that their ballot is ever going to make its way back on that donkey is just remote, right? But the fact of the matter is that they just can't fight the cycle time. So the Military Overseas Voting Enhancement Act that President Obama signed into law last year um, was intended to update something called the Akava Act from 86, which was the idea there was that if you are a military or overseas stationed uh, individual, not just vacationing, not just because you chose to work, but your employer sent you over there or you've been repositioned over there, whatnot, as an expat, you had a right to vote absentee. Well, it turned out that actually implementing that was a nightmare. Uh, you know, and just didn't work. So they said, look, we're in a digital age. 
And sure enough, a federal law was passed that states had to provide a digital way to deliver a blank ballot to an overseas voter who wants to participate in their home jurisdiction back here in the states. It left silent as to how to get that ballot back. But the Department of Defense came in and said, well, listen, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll trade ballots for bullets here. Um, when I'm out there in the backfield, I, I really want to make sure my ballot gets back. So if you deliver my ballot to me digitally, doggone it, I'm going to return it digitally. I do it right now by fax machine. I do it by email attachment. And of course, the Voting Verification Committee hates that. It's like, are you kidding me? And I think you can see why. Do you think an email attachment's secure? Do you think you just gave up the, the uh, at least the, the privacy, the privacy of your ballot, let alone security? Well, it happens. They fax them, they email them. The District of Columbia had a new elections director came in, and he saw this, and he said, there's no way I'm going to let that happen. That's just crazy. There's no security. There's no privacy. There's nothing to protect those ballots. But he couldn't just shut off the fax machine or turn down the mail server because that would raise another political problem. So he came to us and said, we know you want to put your ballot server into production in our district. We need you to help us. We need you to help us come up with an experiment that would allow us to digitally return a ballot in the same way that we digitally de deliver it. That is, allow them to mark it on screen and using an architecture to get it back in, in, a, in a manner no less secure than email or fax. We agreed. But that's all it was. And we agreed on some conditions, that they would expose it to a public vetting period, and that anyone would be given the opportunity to try to hack and break the system. And if they did, they had to agree to not deploy it. They agreed. Well, the amplified issue around this was remote balloting, right? So there are, there are those of us, us included, who believe that using the internet to transact live ballot data is just a bad idea because there is no way in the world you can ever produce, under the current IP architecture we have today, a secure system. And that's another whole conversation. I'll ask you to take it on faith that that's true. And I know that we've got generations coming up behind us who can't even spell facsimile, who understand voting because they watch American Idol, <laughs> and, who 20, and who 20 years from now are going to be running the state houses and have their own idea, iPhone in hand, or whatever device in hand, Android phone preferably, that how they're going to vote. So this will change. But for now, the ostriches rule, the sand is soft, and that just isn't happening. And I kind of agree with them. But that's a technical discussion for another day. And for those of, those of us who think that PKI is an alternative, um, I can tell you with great experience, we made that mistake at Netscape. Digital certificates and digital signatures are not ready for prime time, not even 15 years later. So we agreed to the public evaluation period, and one of the really zealous groups that wanted to take a whack at this was a computer science team at the University of Michigan. The fallout was enormous. So the focus of the DC project was on these two pieces of our framework, the ballot design studio and the remote ballot marker. Tomorrow you'll learn more about this, this architecture. So the overseas remote balloting problem is such that we know it exists. People say, yes, you have to deliver blank ballots, but don't you dare bring back a, digitally, a ballot filled out and by digital means in return. There's a lot of danger of pseudologic about why that'll fail and why it's, although we know it's no worse than email or fax, it just feels worse to people. So, when you expose yourself to a public evaluation period by people, and I have to emphasize this carefully, of a wide spectrum of understanding of what you do and don't do, the best intentions for the outcome of that is as ACDC could sing it no better. So what happened there? Well, because there was a great deal of energy to show that this project couldn't work because people had to make their point for their cause that the internet's a dangerous thing. They were overzealous in trying to find a way to break the system. Unfortunately, it, it happened. They did break it, but not because they were miracle hackers. So here's what happened. And this kind of should tie up all the other slides previously if I do this right. A little lack of sleep. So you had to look at this from two sides. All right? And so 
you have to understand too that there's a truism in the media that if it bleeds, it leads. So I give you a choice of headlines. Show of hands, you tell me which headline you think sells better. District of Columbia internet voting pilot succumbs to release engineering faux pas. Or Iranian and Chinese hackers compromise American voting system, ballot stolen. <laughs> All right, doesn't take too much do to cue that one. All right, so let's look at this through the eyes of the intrusion team. So the University of Michigan's team is, is set loose to, to get after the system. They're given the IP address, they're given the segment it lives on, and away they charge. And the first thing that they happen upon doing a little bit of IP snooping is a box that looks like it's open. And they start piddling around start Googling manuals and discover it's a Cisco router. Oh my God, the mother load. And so they said, well, let's look up the Cisco router manuals and just see if we can figure out if uh, maybe they did something stupid like use the default password. And my God, they did. <laughs> you can imagine these sophomores right now. I mean, their left legs are soaking wet. So they're, they're like, okay, we're in. <laughs> and so here they go. And then the next thing they discovered was, oh my God, these devices are webcams. And they start moving them around saying, this is great. We're actually inside the vault. We can see the systems administrators. They don't even notice us. And they're panning the cameras around. They're madly texting their professor. Haldeman, get back here, get back here. You're not gonna believe this. And so then they got to the next device, which is, was the ballot server, and they got into it, and lo and behold, by munging around, they found a full file of every registered voter overseas entitled to vote in this election. So they snagged that one. Then they said, well, why stop there? Let's see if we can do some, have some fun here. So they started doing some SQL injection. And they got in and said, well, what if we hack along a file name here and see if we can jump the system on how ballots are getting uploaded back in? It worked. Then they said, well, let's not stop there. Let's see if we could actually start injecting fake ballots. That worked too. At this point, they said, well, we got to get out of here because daylight's coming in, but we'd really want to leave something left behind. This stuff's beautiful. The media loves this stuff. So they did. They decided they'd be nice and they would close up shop. Oh, and by the way, they changed that router password because doggone it, they noticed IP addresses from China and Iran were banging away on this thing and they didn't want them to get in. So, well, we'll just change the password and then we'll send an email to the District of Columbia's IT folks in the morning. Um, and we better change a couple of other things here to make sure that file never goes away again. And we'll leave a calling card, which they did. Every time a person who was in the testing period finished filling out a ballot and hit the upload and got the thank you, the University of Michigan fight song played. <laughs> Can't make this stuff up. Let's look at it from the other side because right at this point, we're dead, right? We, we are bumbling idiots. So what really happened? So, one of the things about working with the government I mentioned earlier was the transom. One of the things we had to do in terms of transparency and regulations was not allow anybody from our team access to the data center. It was verboten. We couldn't step foot inside the data center beyond a counter in reception. We had to hand everything over through an agreed to drop box that the, that the, uh, the district had set up with security protocols and whatnot and dozens of readme text files. Seriously, that was the way we communicated with the IT administrators inside who were going to put this thing into production. So we had to cross our fingers and toes and hope they actually read the readme files and everything would be done as they said. So here's what happened. A very zealous systems administrator on the inside said, okay, it's time to roll the, te the, the test, the development server over to production. So we really got to go fast, so we mirrored it including slash temp. I'll come back to that one in a moment. He then said, well, doggone, there's this new software live that just got revved. I'll go ahead and do that too. They'll be certainly happy with that. So I'll install the latest editions of these two additional libraries that have to do with how you do field parsing. Think injection. 
And isn't that great? We got everything loaded real quickly, we upgraded things, and off we go to dinner. Lollapalooza. Meanwhile, back in the District of Columbia, by the way, their, their data center is in Alexandria, all right? Meanwhile, back in the district, a couple of guys who are working late said, you know, Joe, um, that 7,000 router is still sitting in the box, isn't there, back at the shop? They, yeah, it's on the dock. He said, you want to stay late and configure it? Yeah, picks up the phone. Hey, Steve, yeah, hey, before you go, man, man, there's a router on the, on the, on the dock. Would you, would you haul that in and plug it in for us? We're going to go get some dinner, come back and configure it. Uh, yeah, okay, man, sure. Where should I plug it in? I don't know, anywhere. Here's a, here's a set of segments, just plug it in. Okay, dude. So he goes and he pulls the router out of the box. I mean, we've got pictures of this. Not even all the foam wrapping is off of it. Plugs it into the wall, plugs an internet cable, goes to dinner. These guys go to dinner, and they come back later. What the hell, man? I can't get into the router. I'm, I'm looking at the manuals, there's a default password. I can't get into the router. What segment is that router plugged into? Oh, it's plugged in on a test segment, okay. Well, it's getting to be three o'clock in the morning, they say, screw it. Come back in at seven, the elections director's IT guy comes back in, and he says, Bleh! what's this router doing plugged into the segment? Well, we're configuring it. Did anybody tell you what that segment's being used for? No, man, what's it used for? Uh, it's the public evaluation for the voting system pilot. You just opened the door for people to come flooding in. Wonder bunnies. So now they start testing, they're continuing to test the system, they start getting phone calls flooding. Why is the University of Michigan fight song playing <laughs> every time I vote? <laughs> IT manager says, all right, this is pretty cute. Which one of you is the Michigan alumni? <laughs> Nobody, man. We got some guys from Georgetown. We got some guys from Carnegie Mellon. There's a guy from Brown. Uh, there's a guy from Michigan State. Well, all right, well, we know he didn't do it. <laughs> so we've got this folly of collections of cascading errors coming, right? No single point of failure. But let's get back to that software library. So Professor Haldeman has now contacted, by the way, God love him. First thing he did was call Fox News. <laughs> the second call he made was to the IT director in District of Columbia and said, hey, um, we thought we should share with you what we've done because we think we've compromised the system. And so uh, he described what he did and they call us up and they said, you know, what in the hell? We just did an inventory. These things are running. You got these software libraries. Our CTO, I mean, you could hear him. I'm up in Portland, Oregon. He's in, he's in Menlo Park. Don't! Our really zealous systems administrator didn't read this readme file that said, do not, do not, do not, whatever you do, do not upgrade SLIDE. If you do, it will break the system and it will expose the very vulnerability that we've necessarily patched by not upgrading. Best laid plans, the transom. So from our side, a folly of, of errors had nothing to do with our code. Nothing. It was a release engineering problem. But people lost their jobs over it. And that sucks. A guy who just wanted to configure a router, who didn't get the memo, about what segment he was plugging into. The guy in the data center who just said, hey, dude, um, you know, I'll be glad to plug in the router, you know? But this is the world of politics and government and the fishbowl. I mean, I'm telling you, those bus tracks look mighty fine on your back if you're in the wrong position because people start getting tossed and sacrificial lambs reign. And it sucked, it really sucked. And before it was done, some fairly senior level people got, got, got dumped too. But should they have? Wasn't the port point of this pilot to demonstrate what works and doesn't work and where the problems are? By the way, they took it offline. They never used it. No ballots were damaged in the, in the running of that exercise. Yes, there was some files exposed of voter registration information. By the way, that's because somebody dumped the test suite into slash temp 
assuming that on reboot, you clear temp, you move, move over to production, who's going to mirror slash temp, right? So a lot of silly errors that I don't know rise to the level of termination. But nevertheless, taken all together, the system failed, the district looked bad, city councilwoman was you know, ready to kill some people. There's some danger doing this. So the media frenzy and, and PR crisis was crazy, right? I mean, it was nuts. Fox News was playing you know, the University of Michigan thing over and over again until it just couldn't handle it anymore. MSNBC was covering it. Um, as I said, choose your headline right there, right? So I had actually had elections jurisdictions guys come send me emails saying watching this fallout. And, and by the way, I was hamstrung time. Unfortunately, my, my, my wife was, was literally fighting for her wife, life due to a surgical infection in the hospital. And I was gone for four weeks just getting bits and pieces of this. Um, but I had emails coming in from elections directors from around the country saying, is this, is this what you call transparency? Is this your idea of transparency? This fishbowl exercise? and everything that's fallen out, because if that's your idea of transparency, it's not going to happen here. I want nothing to do with it. So the lessons learned here, to wrap this up and just getting into my question and answer time, so I apologize. I think there's four things here to think about. Um, factoring time. If you're going to take a project into production, all the things we know in the commercial software world apply here too, in the deployment side. Compressed schedules guarantee trouble. Ah, we'll mirror the whole system. Ah, we'll just plug this router in here, what the heck. Oh, somebody didn't read that memo. Um, transparency versus scrutiny, right? So, I mean, concentrated reviews drive a level of fault intolerance, right? Because under any normal circumstance, if this happened in your group and your team, that guy's buying the pizza, right? Because he upgraded, upgraded the library and screwed you up and he's got to back it out and you got to start over. He plugged the router into the wrong segment idiot. You know, it's easy, right? You fix it, nobody's ever, nobody ever knows it. In this fishbowl, it happens and you're fired. That's crazy. Um, web application design. Quick point about that. That's another whole topic of discussion that we, that we give in different, in different venues. Um, I think you've got to understand that applications for high value, high risk data require a lot of hard work to avoid brittleness. I argue that the vast majority of web applications today are brittle by nature. I think that there's no immunity from mistake in the public setting. And I mean, the most seasoned teams can fall victim to stupid little mistakes. Software libraries, network devices, staging to production, etc. So get the process, uh, the public evaluation process right. Make sure you have enough time, do lots of pre-testing. All that stuff that you put in the fishbowl, now nah, you probably should do it behind the scenes, then put it in the fishbowl. Does it a little bit rehearsed? Is it a little bit staged? Yeah, unfortunately it is. It makes for nice theater. But when PR is around, I think you have no choice. Managing that reality distortion field, really important. I think you could, those things speak for themselves. And managing uh, expectations. Um, Speaking of which, in terms of expectations going forward, I really ought to give uh, the last four or five minutes a chance for anybody to have any questions. And thanks for um, lumbering through this with me.
Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Me and Lola, we we needed to be banging away on it. Um, this happened so fast because they compressed the evaluation time. This thing was turned on on a Friday night, and a lot of guys were exhausted. We said, let them hack away at it. We didn't dream what had happened. We should have. We should have come right back and and done participated right alongside them. And and yeah, next time to every extent we can, we will. Two last quick questions. Yes, sir. Um, I think I've been hearing you talk about the thing you about story. But, I, you know, so where you started with the talk was when you talked about how all um, you have to have a need for trade programs, you have to trust the layers and more layers so that you can get off the street. Right. And you're off the street for the cost. And certainly we're going to have a lot of needs these days about it. Down the side sure, the sure. Has anybody done a real audit as to you know, what all of this, all of these extra regulations actually cost? Yes, David Wheeler has an, a very nice treatise on the real total cost of ownership in the open source world. You can Google it. I think I have a link. I might throw it up on a slide tomorrow. But there has been one. Brian Seaback on our board of directors, the former CIO of the District of Columbia. Not former because of what happened, but he was a he was a, a victim of politics. The mayor didn't get reelected. Um, he has done some considerable work in that space. And then Anish Chopra, uh, America's CTO, has a team of people who are focusing on this right now. Last question there on the end in the orange, please. So you said before about the development risk appointment. Is it, is it really your responsibility to make sure that it's right? Is it your responsibility to make them to test what they're doing? Or can you start with like, why can't you? So, I think I understand your question, and, and of course, I, I always want to say, well, who's asking, right? Because there are some who say, absolutely, it's incumbent upon us, and there are, other, and there are those on our side who say it's not. Um, is it the responsibility of the Mozilla Foundation's core team to go test deployment of, you know, large-scale deployment of Firefox or, or LDAP servers or whatever it may be? Um, you know, to, to ensure that. We should have our own testing facility and certain certain production environments where we can control those parameters. We we should take that responsibility, and we do, so that we can like, at least write readme files that, that make sense. But I think you've hit, a, hit on the point that is currently a pressure point in controversy in the deployment of open source software in the government setting, which is where does that demarcation line rest? Who's got the responsibility for the deployment half of this equation, and who should be held accountable. Thus, by the way, the OPL. Thank you very much.